The bugs send another meteor our way. But this time, we're ready. Planetary defenses are better than ever. Stellaris Developer Diary 250 is dropped, and this week we've got another massive dev diary. We're going to be looking at two new megastructures or constructions, both of which fundamentally altering some of the way we currently think we play the game, the Scalarium Specialist Vassal, more Specialist Holdings, and some Galactic Community Resolutions. Stick around for all of that and more, and without any further ado, let's dive in and find out what is going on. Orbital rings, we have seen them before, we have seen some images, we've also been told the name, but finally we're getting some concrete information on what they are and what they do. So, basically, orbital rings are a tier 3 voidcraft engineering technology that requires you to already have star holds, galactic administration, and ceramo metal infrastructure. Like habitats, they do not require mega engineering. These orbital rings are treated as a variant of star bases. And while system control is still primarily determined by the actual star base of the system, the planets they surround cannot be invaded until the orbital ring has been disabled. I'm going to read that again. The planets that they surround cannot be invaded until the orbital ring has been disabled. As we can see clearly from this image, the orbital rings have a military power. They are basically planetary defenses that will be able to fight back against enemy ships in the system. For a long time, people have been asking for interactive planetary defenses that can fight against enemy ships. This does seem to go somewhat towards uh, scratching that itch for some people. To start with, your orbital ring will have two module slots and no building slots. And as you can see from the interface here, from this UI, it looks very, very similar to a starbase. However, the modules and buildings are fundamentally different, and we're going to be able to find out exactly what those differences are. As we gain additional starbase technologies, that is Star Fortress and Citadel, and there is also a requirement to upgrade and improve the planet's capital building, therefore you'll need 25 and 50 pops to upgrade these ring structures to their highest level, I believe. You can upgrade the orbital ring through two additional tiers. Each one will add another module and a building slot. And I also go I'm going to have to assume it's going to increase the military power of the orbital ring. Most of the orbital ring modules are similar to starbase modules. Defensive modules, instead of having piracy protection, get extra hull and armor instead. And there is a special habitation module, which is a ring specific module that will add a district slot to the planet below. Basically, you're going to be able to increase the number of districts on your planet below by offsetting some of that uh, space requirement up into orbit. That is definitely very cool. And other than that habitation module, they are basically all normal modules. The shipyard gives you plus one shipyard capacity, the anchorage gives you plus four naval cap. We can also put planetary defense guns, they're going to add two medium sized weapon slots to the orbital ring, planetary defense batteries, adding two missile weapon slots to the orbital ring, and planetary defense hangars. Yep, you've guessed it, adding strike craft to the ring. So basically, we can now turn our planets into proper fortress worlds that can not only defend against fleets and stop them moving through a system, but also actively fight back against fleets with weapons of their own. This also means that multiple planet systems can now become an exceptionally thorny obstacle if you build multiple defense orbital rings supporting some kind of starbase bastion at the center. And as we've seen from the UI, it does seem like we're going to be able to put defense platforms around our orbital rings as well. So with the rework that's coming to the way defense platform works and the outputs for our defense platforms and kind of the balance there, it might finally be that we can build a system that is properly impenetrable to the enemy in the late game. And that would be very, very interesting. That is going to shift the dynamics and the balance of power uh, slightly away from fleets and slightly more towards star-based defenses and now planetary defenses as well. That is very interesting. 
but that is only the modules. We're also getting a massive array of buildings that we can place inside our ring. Our ring is conveniently uh, around our planet and that gives us an opportunity to enhance the planet with some of these buildings. So what have we got? We have low gravity mega refiners. They're going to add minerals, plus two minerals from miners. Stratospheric ionization elements. They're going to add plus two energy credits from technicians. And climate optimization stations. Again, plus two to basic resources, this time with food. So right off the bat here, we have three wonderful buildings that are going to improve the economic output of planets where you build one of these orbital rings. Getting bonuses to the base output as well is very, very important because these bonuses to base output from our resource jobs will be multiplied by all of those extra multiplicative bonuses that you will be accumulating as the game goes on. Next, we have a string of buildings that improve the amenity outputs of your maintenance drones, synapse drones, and clerks. That's plus one amenities apiece. Though with the Gigamore, which is the clerk building, we're going to also be getting plus 5% trade value. This will improve clerks. It's an interesting one here. Plus one amenities going from two to three means that clerks produce more amenities now than priests, which is quite interesting balance. And they'll be producing as many amenities as our uh, politicians, the regular, uh, the regular politician job, which is a ruler job. They now only produce three amenities. So that's very interesting from a balanced perspective. And finally, we have three buildings that improve our specialist output. The first one here is Orbital Filing System. This is going to improve our priests, bureaucrats, and telepaths, all giving them plus one unity. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, well, if we combine bureaucrats here with something like Byzantine bureaucracy, we're going to be getting bureaucrats with a base unity output of six unity. And that's actually pretty nice before we have any modifiers. Orbital logistics system and alloy processing facilities. You've probably seen these two coming. They improve the output of artisans and metallurgists. Artisans will get plus one consumer good output and metallurgists will get plus one alloy output. That means you are probably almost certainly going to build one of these rings around all of your alloy producing worlds. And that way you're going to be getting a minimum of plus three output, two from the metallurgist building, the, the uh, improved building gives plus two to the base output there, and plus one from this alloy processing facility for a total of at least six alloys in output before we even get any modifiers in the mix. That is going to be really bonkers when we're looking at our production. The artisan output here looks a little weak and we're only getting plus one consumer goods. Really, I think from a balanced perspective, that should be doubled to plus two consumer goods as one consumer good is really worth about two alloys from a mineral upkeep perspective. And of course, these are not final numbers, so things may change before release. On top of that, many standard starbase buildings can also be placed on one of our orbital rings, though some are now limited to one per system. Orbital rings will fill the same orbital slot as habitats, so you will now have to decide which of the two you want over your worlds. And they can only be built around a colonized habitable planet. I mean, really, this change is one of the, uh, I think this is really quite a big change here. This is going to improve the effectiveness of fortress worlds and fortress systems, possibly quite dramatically, as well as having some serious economic impacts on the game. Our base resource output, or the amount of resources we can now produce, is going up. That is, uh, that is a power creep thing, but I think it's going to be a fun one and hopefully a good one. I do imagine that the purpose of this is meant to be styled towards tall builds, although uh, as it's priced at the moment at only a thousand alloys in two years of build time, this is going to be very easy to build on all of your core and important worlds. And if you're enjoying this video, please fortify that like button. They are also revealing another mega structure. This time we will have to have the mega engineering uh, technology already researched, but what is the quantum catapult? So, there comes a time in every Overlord's reign when a faraway crisis suddenly requires your immediate attention. Things are going on halfway across the galaxy, a rival in the way has closed their borders to you, and the galactic community is needlessly debating something about the Tianki. If this body is not capable of action, 
I suggest new leadership is needed. A true galactic overlord has the ability to project their power at will across the galaxy. And they will not let these little things like treaties and galactic politics stop them from enacting their plans. Introducing the quantum catapult. A quantum catapult harnesses the power of a neutron star or pulsar to twist the fabric of space and allows you to skip a fleet across great distances in the blink of an eye. Built around neutron stars or pulsars, quantum catapults are going to allow you to hurl a fleet across the incredible distances of space, but these megastructures do have some accuracy issues over long distances. This does now explain the tweet we saw a few days ago with the reticule placed somewhere amongst the galaxy, and now we know what it does. It will give us a button to launch a fleet from a system with a quantum catapult. But it does tell us in the UI here in the tooltip that quantum catapults will lose accuracy with range. So fleets will appear in a random system within the indicated scatter radius. There is a maximum range to quantum catapults. As you can see from the screenshot here, there is a range we can see uh, highlighted. It is significantly longer than a jump drive range, but there is a risk the fleet may not land exactly where they are intended to. The further the launch, the wider the scatter radius. As you upgrade your quantum catapult, because of course it's a mega structure, it has multiple different tiers, so as we upgrade it, it will become more accurate and have a longer maximum range. With a well-placed, fully constructed catapult able to threaten virtually anywhere, even in a huge galaxy. And that is a very important point here. So basically they're telling us um, as long as you upgrade this, it doesn't matter what size galaxy you play on, you'll be able to impose your will on any star system at a moment's notice. With, yes, a, a small margin of error, absolutely. So after selecting a desired target system and a short wind up later, your fleet will arrive somewhere in a nearby system without any lingering jump debuffs. I'll say that again, there are no jump debuffs. But there is a chance, especially on a spiral galaxy, that this quote unquote nearby system is quite a few jumps away from our intended destination when we are considering traveling via hyperlanes. This could lead to some very, very interesting and meme-worthy accidents. You try to jump your fleet into a system to go and assist and, and regroup somewhere, and oop, they've jumped straight into the Crisis home system and they're dead. Or they've jumped into the Enigmatic Fortress and they're dead. Or they've jumped into, I don't know, the Marauder system, which you were patiently and carefully trying to keep alive so you could recruit their admirals, and you've accidentally slaughtered all of the Marauders. Quantum catapults will also have a passive effect that will reduce your missing in action time for your missing fleets. This will come in useful when moving reinforcements to the front line, when you're using experimental subspace on your science ships, or if your launched fleet lands in a system with closed borders. Ah, okay, so if you send your fleet off and it lands in a system you cannot enter, the fleet will go missing in action and have to slowly return back home. So this means you cannot simply uh, launch a fleet into a system you wouldn't otherwise be able to enter for diplomatic reasons, but you can move it to a system you wouldn't be able to find a path to, let's say if there were lots of uh, FTL blockers or simply the space between you and that system was closed to you. It's also not mentioned how many fleets we can send off with this megastructure at a time. I'm assuming it's only one uh, because they've not mentioned it, though it might be that you can send as many fleets as you want from this system at any particular time. But what do you think about these new orbital rings and quantum catapult, these two crazy new megastructures we're getting? If you've got any thoughts, please let me know down in the comments below. The Scholarium is the last of the three specialist subject types that is coming in Overlord. This vassal is dedicated to the advancement of science and must rely entirely, or at least very heavily, on their Overlord to defend them from enemies. Here we can see the state of Satuma, and it is one of our Scholarium minions. It is bringing us the secrets in the universe, in exchange with our benevolence and beneficence, we are providing it protection. 
It's uh, a totally fair and non-mafia-esque system. Again, this UI highlights the fact that there are multiple tiers to these vassal types, and as you go up the various tiers, you unlock more and more benefits. But what are those benefits? Well, let's find out immediately. As with other specialist empire types, there is a base bonus you get for each tier. So, at tier 1, the Scholarium will be getting plus 20% scientific research and plus 1 research alternatives. I'm not sure if that's research speed or research output. I'm assuming it's output, but it's not quite clear actually from this wording. In, uh, in response to that, what is their penalty? Well, the subject will be getting minus 30% naval capacity, plus 30% ship build cost, and plus 30% military ships upkeep. That is a very, very devastating penalty that's only going to get worse as we increase our level. At tier 2 and 3, we of course increase these bonuses and penalties up to a maximum of plus 40% monthly scientific research and minus 50% naval cap, a 50% increase to military ship cost and upkeep. Those are very crippling bonuses. It isn't actually mentioned here if there are any specific um, subsidies or, or anything like that that must be given or, or supplied by the overlord or the subject, so it's possible that it is not required for the subject to give some of that massive science production to the overlord. And if they're not required to do that, this could be quite a delicate balancing act. Yes, you as an overlord go and subjugate a neighbor and you make them a scholarium. Their research is vastly, vastly improved. And you're thinking, well, it's fine. I have massive navies compared to them and they have some big modifiers. But of course, with a game like Stellaris, as you increase the amount of research technology you have, as you go down the tech tree, you're going to unlock more and more benefits that are going to mean, let's say, you have unlocked, say, battleships and some of the best X-slot weapons in the game. Well, a Scholarium with that kind of weaponry, along with the society techs that will vastly increase your naval capacity, could be in a position to overthrow their technologically inferior overlord. So that is definitely something you will want to look out for. Whilst the Prospectorium, now that was the economically focused specialist vassal, and whilst the Prospectorium can discover valuable deposits in their space, instead the Scholarium has the opportunity to learn. As you get more and more bonuses and level up, you will get, for instance, Scholarium Planetary Sensors plus 20% or a 20% chance for finding a research cache every year. But what is a research cache, I hear you ask? Don't worry. Scholarium Discovery number one, when you unlock that, you uh, may find research caches, physics, engineering, and society that give plus 2,000 research points. At the beginning of the game, that is going to be a very, very nice bonus. Additionally, as you go up the levels and you unlock Scholarium Discovery 2 and Scholarium Discovery 3, the benefits of these research caches are going to increase. It's going to go from 2,000 to 3,000 and finally 4,000 research points per discovery. And planetary sensors at the highest level may yield rare caches. They will add to research technologies a random technology. That is pretty cool. Though I assume these are technologies you could otherwise discover but just haven't managed to roll yet. Not specifically new technologies unique to the Scholarium. The advisor perk, as you may have suspected, will improve the Overlord's scientific research. They're going to get a plus 10% to monthly scientific research. Again, I'm not entirely sure if this is research output or research speed, research rate. If it's research rate, I would say that's better than plus 10% research output as we're going to have lots and lots of modifiers to our research output as the game goes on, which will be less than uh, the modifiers we get to our research speed. So a 10% bonus to research speed will generally, by the end of the game, be much better than a 10% bonus to research output. Just like the others, they have a hyper relay effect at tier 1. This is called Scholarium Tutelage, and it basically says the Overlord's relay network will proj. I'm assuming that's project, and then following effects, if connected to the S, I'm assuming that's Scholarium, Beyond that, really, it's entirely speculation. Next week, we are finding out what the relay network does. There's been a lot of hints here. We know it's something movement-based. There might be a new revolution happening with uh, movement. The relay network may harken back to the old days where we had three different types of FTL, possibly. Maybe it's doing something else we simply do not know yet. 
When you get to tier two with the Scalarium, you of course unlock some special traits for your leaders. And as well, the ability to trade scientists to the Overlord. What are the traits they can get? Well, the first one, which is definitely a very, 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 very good one, is Scalarium Investigator, plus 10% research speed. Combine this with something like Erudite as well as Genius, and you're looking at a 40% additional research speed from a single scientist. That would be absolutely bonkers. The other two are fine, uh, survey speed plus 20%, that's fine, and a Scholarium Observer, anomaly research speed plus 25%, and anomaly discovery chance plus 5%. However, both of these are only really useful in the early game, possibly the mid game if you have few AI in your universe or few empires, but relatively speaking, by the time you have subjugated a neighbor, you've probably done most of the exploring you're going to do, and that means that these two bonuses here are not really going to be so useful as opposed to the Scholarium Investigator, that juicy plus 10% research speed. When we look at the Overlord, we are able to trade with the Overlord again, but we're also going to be getting plus one leaders in our pool. And the subject scientists will be getting plus two to their leader level cap. That is quite nice as a nice extra little bonus. Finally, at the third tier, the Scalarium gains an advanced variant of the science ship, the Actrellis. Like the Prospectorium's battle right, it provides an aura in combat. And hold on to your seats, ladies and gentlemen, this is pretty wild. The Arctrellis is a science ship that allows your scientists to cripple opposing ships piloted by artificial intelligences. Whether those are machine intelligences, sapient combat computers, or the contingency. The bonus is minus 25% accuracy, minus 25% ship fire rate, and minus 25% base ship speed. The fire rate is nasty though, not entirely uh, something you can offset because you could offset that by having lots and lots of ship fire rate bonuses stacked, but the minus 25 accuracy will be very, very nasty. Psionic destroyers with 90% evasion that are enforcing a minus 25% accuracy on the enemy are going to be nigh impossible to hit. When we combine this with the battle right, this is going to mean we have some fantastic and interesting ways of using our vassals to massively beef up our military potential, not just the other aspects of our empire, that being economic and research. And we're going to be able to unlock some very, very unique bonuses to really show the enemy why we have a right to rule the galaxy. And if you're enjoying this video and the other videos on this channel, and you'd like to support this channel, you can do so by becoming a channel member and joining, by supporting this channel on Patreon and becoming a patron, or alternatively, using the affiliate link in the description and purchasing something from the Humble Bundle store. At the moment, there are some great games bundles on the Humble Store. There is the Game Night by Asmodee, a series of digitized board games, such as Game of Thrones, the board game, the Industrious Sims Bundle, containing such fun games as Sim Casino and Sim Airport, and the Killing Floor Collection. All of these bundles start for as little as just $1, and a portion of all sales go to charity. And there are more holdings to be revealed to us. So each of these specialist empires has a unique holding that their overlord can build on their worlds. We'll start with the first one. The Prospectoria can host the Offworld Foundry, which converts the subject minerals into alloys for the Overlord. Basically, this building will allow you to, it looks like, have two metallurgist jobs on the Prospectoria's planet, and you're going to get the output from two metallurgists. I don't actually think this is as good as the, uh, the, the government agency we saw, which basically allows you to take alloys production from your subject's worlds. Uh, if they are producing alloys, each metallurgist will basically give you one or two of the alloys. That was definitely a better uh, overlord holding than this one, but this one I suppose is good if your, uh, if your Prospectoria doesn't have much in the way of alloy production, but if it doesn't, that's another issue. Bulwarks can have the Vigil Command, which grants additional defense platforms to their Overlord. As the Bulwark increases in its tier, these values will also increase. At the moment, the Vigil Command shows us that we get a Overlord Empire modifier of plus one defense platform cap. I assume it's going to go plus two and plus three as we upgrade the Bulwark. However, that can be modified by other bonuses, other perks. This is looking like 
we may, if they rebalance the defense platforms and stations correctly, and we also have our new planetary defenses, that is the orbital rings, uh, chocked to the teeth with planetary defense batteries and, uh, and that sort of thing, we may actually be able to build nigh impregnable systems which cannot be taken except at a massive, massive cost to the enemy in terms of ships, resources and materiel. Now, that entirely relies on an effective rebalancing of defense platforms. Possibly they need to be able to build X-slot weapons, that sort of thing, because at the moment, ships you can stack fleets up, jump into a system and basically delete uh, a citadel with all of its defense platforms from the edge of the system at range with complete impunity. Ion cannons get to fire basically once and then they're useless because they will be knocked out. This hopefully will change but we will just have to wait and see with bated breath. Scholarium worlds can build the Ministry of Science. Surrounding their planet with additional science ships increases the effect of the building. This Really? Okay, let's break this down. So what does it do? It gives you an Overlord Empire modifier of plus 3%. Then for each science ship in orbit, you get plus another 3%, and that's research speed. So if you find yourself with three Scholariums, or four or five, and you make sure to put one of these Ministries of Science down on each one, and fill them with lots and lots of science ships, uh, three science ships apiece, that looks to me like we can get uh, either 9 or 12 percent, I'm not entirely sure, uh, but, but we can get at least around 10 percent extra research speed per Scholarium Vassal. If there are a one planet Vassal as well, that becomes even more powerful. So we could possibly stack these and end up with, you know, somewhere in the region of like 50 or 60% extra research speed from having five or six individual vassals with only a single planet. The potential for abuse here does look very, very large. There is also a holding that was teased in a tweet recently. Uh, this extra holding is if you have the Tree of Life Origin. It lets you share the great blessing of your tree with your subjects, which will improve both the habitability and food production of your subjects world, though a fair bit of it will be consumed by the sapling itself. This building gives a nice juicy 10% habitability bonus and actually increases the loyalty of the subject. I mean, if, 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 uh, if an overlord tried to plant a tree of life on the planet Earth, I think we might have some issues with that, especially if it tried to do some crazy things like hooking us up to that tree, but, um, but, but fair enough. Uh, also, it gives you plus 18 food production, it seems, for the overlord, and that comes directly, in essence, by leeching food from your subject. This leeching comes from the Overlord Arborist, so there is a worker required to actually maintain and upkeep the tree, and that is a 10 food upkeep, which is definitely not the most fun of upkeep levels, though luckily it is only food, so, you know, go figure. Paying 10 food for a 10% bonus to habitability is almost certainly worth it. That wraps up the holdings but this dev diary is still not finished. It is a very chonky dev diary this week. So we've also got some galactic community resolutions that we're going to look at now. And it seemed natural basically with such a large focus on subjugation with this new DLC, the galactic community would want to stick their nosy nosy uh, noses and their fingers into things and regulate them in different ways. So there are now two more minor resolution lines incoming in the new suzerains and sovereignty category. These are called independently the Intergalactic Directives Resolution and the Bureaucratic Surveillance. That second one sounds like evil and, and malice, but basically, you know, negligent evil, um, kind of the, the scary side of things, I would say there. The Intergalactic Directives line of resolutions will be protecting the rights of subjects and encourages the preservation and release of weaker societies, whilst bureaucratic surveillance will be focusing more on the rights of overlords, requiring a short leash on their subjects, and it will encourage the use of holdings. Resolutions in this second line can only be proposed by empires that are overlords of another empire. 
So it seems like there are three different tiers for the intergalactic directives. The first one is regulated growth. That's going to give you a plus 0.2 monthly loyalty and also empire size from systems plus 5%. Now, we only get two empire size per system, I want to say off the top of my head. So plus 5% on top of that really shouldn't be such a big problem. As we increase the legislative burden on overlords, first off at tier two, integration is no longer permitted. It's not a valid term of agreement between galactic community members. And I assume that's going to mean if you are in breach of that, you're going to get a slap in the face. The other one is expansion. That will be prohibited, or at least you can no longer prohibit the expansion of your vassals. There will be increased monthly loyalty changes, and now we're getting some nasty things, plus 15% empire size from systems, and plus 5% from planets. At tier 3, we get some very positive things, it looks like, for the subjects, basically. So, the three specialist subject types, Bulwarks, Scholaria, and Prospectoria, will all get some improvements. Bulwarks will get improved starbase and defense platforms, Scalaria will get improved planetary sensors, and Prospectoria will have improved resource discoveries. Again, integration permitted is no longer valid, and expansion regulated is no longer valid either. Expansion regulated is the term where a vassal will have to pay some extra influence in order to expand. At this level you get some brilliant improvements to monthly loyalty, however, Every empire in the galaxy will be getting a plus 25% empire size from systems and plus 15% empire size from planets. That is very, very unpleasant, though still manageable. You know, it's not the worst thing here. Let's say you've got 10 planets, that will only be a, an extra 15 empire size. And if you had 50 systems, that's only 25 empire size, so an extra 30, uh, sorry, an extra 40 empire size in total. Uh, for quite a big empire, 50 systems and 10 planets isn't tiny by any stretch of the imagination, but that would only equate to a 4% increase in tech cost and 8% extra tradition cost, so whilst a nuisance, not the end of the world. Bureaucratic surveillance, on the other hand, is going to reduce our monthly loyalty. The first tier reduces it by 0.2, and on top of that, it will push our subjects towards becoming the ethic, uh, or the, the Overlord's fanatic ethic, with a, at tier 1, 25% attraction. At tier 2, this becomes a 50% attraction. Also, independent sensors, so the ability to snoop on your subjects, will be enforced as law. You will not be allowed as a subject to have independent sensors. On top of that, holding limit of four will be removed as a term. Now that seems a bit weird. That seems like we wouldn't be allowed to have um, many holdings. That seems counterintuitive to what we're trying to achieve here. But down in the modifiers, max holdings plus one. So basically your holding limit cannot still go over four but if you have a holding agreement of three, for instance, with a subject, that will actually equal four along with this authority type. Monthly loyalty goes down by 0.7, which isn't pleasant as well. And at the highest tier, independent diplomacy of vassals is no longer allowed. So once you enforce this or, or pass this resolution in the galactic community, all of your vassals will basically have to vote the way you say, and if they don't, they're in breach of intergalactic law. This is such a subversive and evil set of resolutions. I absolutely love it. In the final part of this dev diary, they are going over the Teachers of the Shroud a little bit. Now, there are a couple of things they wanted to make note of here. First, when you take Teachers of the Shroud, which is the new psionic origin basically, your civilization is treated as if it already has the Mind Over Matter Ascension perk, meaning Transcendence is not far away, and therefore you cannot pursue Synthetic or Biological Ascension. But down in the comments, one of the content designers has clarified that this does not mean that Mind Over Matter fills up your first Ascension perk slot. So I am definitely a little confused here. Basically, it's like you've got Mind Over Matter for free with the Origin, it seems, um, which is definitely a bit crazy. But there's a lot more to that Origin, and I have a video covering what this Origin is going to do. If you're interested in finding out exactly what happens with the Teachers of the Shroud, click the video on screen now.